Radical prostatectomy is not a new invention. This is the picture of Pat Walsh and Herb Laporte, who were my teachers in radical prostatectomy, who really defined the way to remove a prostate uh, anatomically without basically damaging surrounding tissues. And those times uh, started, not as many people think, by an American, Hugh Hampton Young. The first radical prostatectomy was done by who? Does anybody know that? Well, the urologists in the room will normally tell you it's Hugh Hampton Young, because this is, you guys are very pro-American, so you like everything that comes from America. And uh, we Europeans are a little bit more reluctant, you know, we don't like Trump really, we like Obama more, so it's, it's a little bit different. But basically, this was the first gentleman who did the first radical prostatectomy. This guy with the beard who looked like an ISIS fighter. This guy in the middle uh, is Theodore Bilro. And Bill Roth, uh, who did Bill Roth 1, Bill Roth 2 gastrectomy, did the first radical prostatectomy. Where? In Vienna, actually in our hospital. The reason why it was not publicized was number one, because he didn't have Fox News and New York Times and CNN behind him, but most importantly, because the patient died the next day. And in those old times, a good surgeon would hide these complications. They would not be talked about. And it's always the fault. This is human, right? Even Bill Roth said, and I can happily show you the book where it said it. We found it about a couple of years ago in our hospital. The report of the first radical prostatectomy, which he did, and he said that the anesthesiologist put the patient too much too deep to sleep, and that's why the bleeding was increased. I have no idea how the anesthesiologist can increase the bleeding, but he did. So he blamed the anesthesiologist, and then he blamed the traction of the bed that why the patient was bleeding so much. Anyways, the patient died from bleeding from the Santorini plexus from a DVC. But this was basically, and all his disciples, by the way, went out to become chairman around or Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. And this is how Dr. Beirut used to teach in the middle of a big, this is uh, the auditorium in our hospital. And you can imagine that the student up here probably didn't learn much from the operation, whereas this guy here probably became a good surgeon. So today, the tools of learning is different, and of course, we have much better outcomes. Now, this being said, this is an old paper by Dr. Swindle, who showed you the outcome of radical prostatectomy. Let's be very clear. My goal when I have cancer is to survive, to be alive, and to have no complications, right? No continence, no potency problems. Uh, no incontinence and no potency problems. And if you look at the result of oncology, even in, 19, in 2005, when it was published, roughly, 93% of patients had 20 years follow-up where cancer-specific survival had a cancer-specific survival, which means that roughly everybody survived. And this was irrespective of stage and ir irrespective of PSA. This is very important to remember. We looked at the PSA and at the radical prostatectomy outcomes in a paper that we published with the biggest centers in Europe at that time doing radical prostatectomy. We just looked at continence results. Look, the continence results is excellent. 82 to 96 percent at one year. The American result for open prostatectomy are 80 to 94, so more or less equal. So patients will become continent, but not everybody. And then you can analyze where do the six percent or four percent come from. It's very simple. It's an basically one-to-one -one correlation with the number of cases you do. If you do 20 cases per year, you will not be that good as when you do 120 cases per year. It's a fact. We are handcraft workers. We are not big scientists, you know, urologists are plumbers. And a plumber is as good as more plumbing as he do. So if you do a lot of cases, you will be good. Each of you could be a perfect robotic surgeon if I give you the opportunity to do 50 cases, 60 cases a year. This is not the fact that you have the geniuses out there. People like Indy Gill or Alex Motry do six cases a day. Of course they're going to learn how to do it well. And if you look at the removal, the, the removal of, 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 of continents over time, it takes about one year. Now, where the difference comes is here. Today, good surgeons or good with good outcomes have very high continence results at three months, close to 80 percent today, 80 to 85 percent. But the minimum is 50 to 60, and over the year, at one year, you're done. So we always recommend, if you put a sphincter in, don't do it before 12 months, except if the patient has, at six months, he needs more than five or six pads. Then probably he's not going to recover that much, and he may need a sphincter even earlier on. Same thing accounts for potency. With potency, we discussed it yesterday. It's very clear that in potency cases, and we are very much aware of that, even if you do a bilateral nerve sparing prostatectomy, you still will have 
40% who will be impotent and have erectile dysfunction. Why? Because potency is not about preservation of the nerves, it's also about preservation of the blood vessels. And if you know very well when you do radical prostatectomy and you keep clipping all the vessels and vessels and vessels, specifically when you clean the endopelvic fascia, you end up closing the blood flow to the penis. And if you do a blood scan analysis of patients after radical prostatectomy, guess what? After radical prostatectomy, your blood flow to the penis decreases by 40%. So there is less than 40, more than 40% less blood flow to the corpus cavernosum. Of course, it makes you impotent to some extent. So even if your nerves are intact, you need the blood flow. That's why it's so important to do penile rehabilitation. Start Viagra early. Give injections. I even add injections at an early stage, the Cavarject, even in patients where I did nerve sparing, because I want the blood to go there quickly. The first couple of weeks are the worst, where the cobra's cavernosum dries literally out. This is not a camel that can go around for 40 days and not need water. Penis needs blood every day. And if you don't do that, you will actually increase the rate of impotence over time, not because of the operation, but because you missed the first two months to give blood to the corpus cavernosum. You did a wonderful operation, but this did not make the patient impotent, but the fact that you forgot to give him Viagra or Cavarjack early on. Now this being said, these are some recent data uh, looking at 30 years anniversary of Pat Walsh's radical prostatectomy. You know, Pat Walsh did not do radical like we do because he did only the rich, the beautiful, the thin, the healthy, the good guys. It was easy. You know, it's a no-brainer to do a radical in those patients. If you were fat, ugly, or poor, Alan Parton will do the case, or Bell Carter will do the case in Hopkins, but definitely not Pat Walsh. Actually, the joke, if you go to, I don't know if anyone has been in Hopkins, if you go to Pat Walsh's office, the chair in his office is very thin, you know, where the patient sits. So imagine you have your average, you know, I apologize saying that, but the average healthy Emirati, you're about 100 kilo. Most of you are expats. So let's say you're 100 kilo, you're fat, you're healthy, you have a lot of food. You sit there, Pat will not operate you. Say, you're too fat, go away. Go to Dr. Carter. So the, the thing is overweight, all these make the complications of the operation. But if you take the good cases and the healthy cases, outcomes of radical prostatectomy is excellent. Excellent for locally advanced disease, excellent for localized disease specifically. And the same is true for continence. Today, continence rates are very, very high. And as a matter of fact, this is the Martini database from Hamburg, which they also do five to six cases per day. And you can see that the results are excellent. I'm not going to go into the detail. And if you cut them down by IIEF, if you have good potency before, you will be pretty much potent afterwards if you do a nerve spray. And they're pretty much 100% sure about that. Remember, most of the people who go into radical prostatectomy already have a little bit of erectile dysfunction. They don't know it because it came slowly, 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 slowly. But if you do IIEF on these patients before surgery, you will see that it gets worse and worse. So what, what is the solution to do that when you do radical prostatectomy in 2017? Big centers like we do now and Hamburg does and Paris does and Alex Motri does in Ghent or people in the US, they're using more and more what we call NeuroSafe. Basically what it means is that in local disease, you can do an intrafascial dissection. So if you have localized prostate cancer, I recommend you to do an intrafascial or at least an interfascial dissection. Never do the extrafascial. When you do intrafascial, which means you basically cut the prostate out of its own capsule, it's like some kind of an enucleation of the peripheral zone, you're 100% sure you kept the nerves. The moment you see the nerves, you didn't hold them. Because a good nerve sparing, you will never see the nerves. And that's why the NeuroSafe allows you also to keep the positive margins low by doing all the time dissection and biopsies of the capsular area, dissection, biopsy of the capsular area to make sure that you don't create positive margins. And like that, you can prevent uh, not only positive margins, but also prevent the patient from becoming impotent. This being said, when you compare open to laparoscopic prostatectomy, this is a very common question. If you look at oncology, you can do a trifecta, pentrafecta, hexafecta, you can do as many fectas as you want. 
But basically, the question is oncology, continence, potency, and quality of life. And if you look at those, again, I want to go back and look at vision. And vision really is not much difference because today we have very good loops with open. So this is open, this is laparoscopy, and uh, no matter how you do the case, today you basically can move on and do a very good operation, and it doesn't matter. This is laparoscopy, obviously you see that laparoscopic prostatectomy is a very tricky operation. By the way, it's not an easy operation. I never embarked on it because I had colleagues who were doing it, so I went straight to the robot, and to be honest with you, the robot is a no-brainer. You learn it quickly, uh, and inshallah when you will all have it, and it will come whether we like it or not in the future, uh, it will be there. It's, it's a train that has left already, it will come. But basically, uh, in terms of vision, they're all the same. Just the robot gives you a little bit of a better vision, even than laparoscopy. <coughs> but the fact is, if you compare open to laparoscopic prostatectomy, let me be very frank with you, there is no difference in quality of life studies here. And if you look at the SUO in 2008, they concluded that there was no difference in oncology, in confidence, in potency, and in quality of life. As a matter of fact, uh, one paper killed laparoscopic prostatectomy, and was the paper by Karim Tougier and James Eastham from Memorial St. Catherine in 2008. Now, Eastham showed the data in 2006 in which he showed that actually open prostatectomy was better in terms of continence and slightly better in terms of potency. And Karim Tougier then published the paper in 2008 in Rao saying that, well, basically there is no difference and open is slightly better. The only benefit of laparoscopy was that you had less blood loss, which is very true, and a quicker return of potency. Now, I always say this is different with kidneys. In kidneys, open is out, except for big cable thrombi or big tumors and some stuff like that. But in prostate, the jury is out. I have a coworker with me who's also a great guy, Dr. Janicek, in my department, and he does a great laparoscopic prostatectomy. He's 65 now. I'm not going to ask him to move to the robot. He would love to, but it doesn't make sense anymore, right? Until he gets to the numbers to be a good robotic surgeon, he's too old. So we're going to leave him, and he does a beautiful laparoscopic prostatectomy. And yet, this, those times are over. The learning curves are too high, it takes too long. And so when we go to the robot, the guidelines now, for the first time, are recommending, probably. But if you look at the guidelines three years ago, three years ago, it said that the robot is not better. You don't need a robot. Then explain to me, while in the United States, 99.5% of cases are done robotically, and in Europe, over 70% are done robotically, if the guidelines say there is no benefit. I don't understand that either. So if you look at the NCCN guidelines, the version 2013, they said that laparoscopic and robotic appear comparable to open. So let's be very frank. So yes, the robot is fashion. It's like you wear Gucci or Prada, your wife's like uh, Louis Vuitton and stuff like that. They like it. They always have want to buy the new bag. Why? Is the old bag not working? Well, it's beautiful. No, because they want the new bag. It's the new Louis Vuitton that you have to pay by doing two radical prostatectomies. So why? Because we humans like the new things, the new tools. And in terms of robots, Let's look at the studies and let's look at what today, and I'm going to be very honest with you, I like robots, I do robots, but I tell you I want to be critical about the robot. And let's be. Between 2000 and 2010, the studies that were done comparing open, lab, and robotics were not favorable to the robot. For example, this was a study by Frotheim Indigil, published in 2008 in which he found no difference, I'm not going to go into the detail, no difference between all these operations. Open, robotic, were equal. There's another paper published in European Urology by Hen van Poppel and Vincenzo Ficara, looking again at the differences, and they concluded the available data are not sufficient to prove, to prove superiority. Again, no difference between robotic, open. And this is not uh, a small study. This is 37 comparative studies and 16 prospective studies uh, included in that analysis. And then came the famous JAMA trial. I mentioned that yesterday. The JAMA trial, I never really understood, but this JAMA trial is neglected, and basically, uh, I would say, there is some kind of censorship from many people on that trial, because it's the biggest trial looking, it was published in 2009,
comparing the outcomes of open and minimal invasive radical prostatectomy. And minimal invasive was a combination of robot and laparoscopy. And basically you can see that patients undergoing open prostatectomy had better continence results and better potency results. I don't believe so much, you know why I think? is because open that was done by good guys who were doing it for many, many years. And laparoscopy in this series was done by young guys who just started with it. So this is not fair comparison. This is unfair to laparoscopy, unfair to the robot. But yet, this study had a big impact. And for four years, the sales of the robot went down, believe it or not. And this was very important to remember. And then came the year 2010. 2010 was the election year in Europe. Of, of what's happening. Because in that, for the first time, you had large enough data on the robotic to make a conclusion on the robot and the open. The first study was still negative. It was a Medicare study published by Jim Barry in the GCO 2012. And he looked at roughly 700 patients. And he found no difference um, between all these technologies. Um, we looked at a similar study looking at the outcomes. And then there was a paper that was published. I put it, it's a joke. It was not in the New York Times. But I put it like to see if you remember it. It was a paper that was published last year looking at the randomized trials of open and robot. And it basically showed one thing. There is no real difference between open and robot. However, the difference is, and this is a conclusion of that paper, that you learn the operation much faster with the robot. The learning curve, a beginner learns the operation much faster with the robot than with open. It took me maybe 100 cases to learn the open. It will take you 30, 20, 30 cases to, to learn the robot. And this is very important to remember. So the future is not about doing surgery only, but also about quantification of your complications, looking at your data, what you did wrong. If a patient sues you, you can go back and see here, look at the data of the robot. I did a good job. Don't blame me. This is not my mistake. And on top of it, you can learn, like we do same with aviation. A pilot is trained on a simulator. No way you will have a pilot who will not be on a simulator. He will be a co-pilot for 10 years, and one day the pilot decides, oh, come on, today you fly. Do you think it works like this? You're going to die if I would tell you the pilot is flying the first time in his life today. You would not accept that. Well, we accept it in surgery. You have residents doing the first time their case. And you cannot control every scissor they cut, you know. If it's cut too late, it's too late. So we need to do that. And for that, we need, obviously, the robots. So just to tell you that, since 2010, papers have changed. And now the recommendation of the EAU, now, after so many years, is that there is a benefit of doing the robot for continence and a little bit for potency. And I will explain to you when. So in general terms, there is no difference. But the problem is that most of the cases today are done with the robot. And you can see that the number of robotic cases is going up significantly. And the number of opens are going down. So will they go down to zero? Never. Because a robot is very expensive. And the biological benefit for the patient is very little. So you cannot have every robot in every department. My time is running out. OK. I have my second talk anyways. I'm going to go quickly. <coughs> One thing I would like to tell you, there was a nice study of open surgeons who did the robot afterwards. Uh, sorry, the open surgeons who don't have a robot, but went to a center with a robot, looked for two weeks at people doing robot, and then came back to their hospital and continued with open. And guess what? Most of these doctors believed that they learned to do a better operation. They were not young residents. They were like 50 years old like me, 60 years old. So exposure to the robot improves your open technique. Why? Because you learn. And believe me, before we got the robot, and it took a very long time to get it, I did the same. And my open technique changed completely. So I will do it. We need randomized trials, such as this one. And in open versus, process, uh, versus robotic, they don't exist so much. I cut down because you asked me to be faster with the local disease. The studies that pu were published in the last two years made some conclusions about the robot. The robot only has a benefit for you if you do more than 100 or 150 cases a year. You don't do 150 cases in Dubai. You don't do 150 cases in Al Ain. And you certainly don't do 150 cases in Abu Dhabi. And that's why the robots that are in, in the Emirates today are considered failure for the companies. You know that. They are not considered good robots. 
A, because you don't have the sufficient numbers. You should be happy. There's not enough prostate cancer here. You don't need it. So do we need a robot today in Dubai? Well, if you, you need it as you need a Ferrari in your garage. It looks good. People look at you and say, wow. But are you going to drive faster with the traffic in Dubai? No. But while you're sitting in traffic, you look much better with the, with the Ferrari than when you sit like me in a Hyundai. You know, it looks much cooler with a Ferrari. But are you going to drive faster with it? Better with it? No. The traffic is the same. So this is the number one conclusion. Number two conclusion is robot is important. If you do enough cases, it will improve continence and slightly potency results. Why? Very simple, because you will do a lot of intrafascial dissection. It's difficult to do it open. So that's why if you don't have a robot, go watch some open robotic surgeons and you will come back and do a very nice intrafascial dissection during open surgery. Number three, also very important, is a great teaching tool for residents. You need it because you can teach residents on the simulator 100 times before they do the first robotic case. And finally, I think it's also very important, we always believe that the robot lacks tactile sense, right? We don't have fingers to feel in high-risk disease. So any questions? Should I take any questions for the localized disease? Or yes, sir. We'll do that. So um, again, my message here for you is: even if you don't have a robot, go and get robotic exposure, exposure or training. It will improve your open technique. This is really my personal quotation. I strongly believe in that, and I think it's a very wise uh, uh, message for countries in which a robot is not affordable or not available and you should not be sad about it. Okay, so let's move to the next talk. And this is about locally advanced disease and high-risk prostate cancer. Now, I put this talk in two parts, dear colleagues. Um, one part is about uh, high-risk prostate cancer, and the second one is for you very interesting, maybe, before you fall asleep, is the oligometastatic disease. Because there's a trend today that is amazing that we are moving to do radical prostatectomy in selected patients with bone metastasis. And you will not think that, and if you take a resident taking the board exam, and he will ask that, well, yes, I can do radical in bone metastatic positive patients, he probably will fail his board. But understand that there are cases in which it's doable. So what is high-risk prostate cancer? So what are the guidelines for high-risk disease? And as a matter of fact, it's very clear that in patients with low and intermediate prostate cancer, uh, it radical prostatectomy does help. This is very clear. Fact is that in selected patients with low volume, high risk prostate cancer, it also helps. So there is evidence, even on the guidelines, that you should do radical prostatectomy in high risk prostate cancer. And in very highly selected patients with very high risk prostate cancer, which was clinical T3B and even T4 prostate cancer, um, in the context of the multimodality treatment, which means adjuvant radiotherapy, you should also do surgery. What does that mean? 10 years ago, high-risk prostate cancer meant what? We did radiotherapy plus hormone therapy, right? For T3 disease 10 years ago. When I was a resident, we would never touch a patient with high-risk prostate cancer. We would do radiotherapy and hormone therapy. Today, this notion has changed. Today, we don't do radiotherapy. We do surgery first, then we do adjuvant radiotherapy. So this is a change of paradigm. So who's the best candidate for radical prostatectomy in high-risk prostate cancer? And if you look at the different definitions, they're more or less the same. Is a high PSA over 20, tennis age T2C or T3, and a Gleason score above 7, 8, 9, 10. This is high-risk prostate cancer. So why is there a benefit of radical prostatectomy in high-risk disease? Number one, because it allows you a pathological staging of the primary tumor and of the lymph nodes. You will know if you have N1 disease or not. You all know very well if the CT or even a PET PSMA shows you a lymph node, it not necessarily is a positive lymph node. So if you do surgery, you will know it for sure, and you know if you need hormone therapy or not. Number two, it will be a downgrading and downstaging, and that may potentially spare patients from adjuvant therapy. Then, possibly, it will avoid post-treatment additional therapies in the future, and we have a better PSA, because after surgery, the PSA is very reliable, whereas if your prostate is still inside, 
PSA is not that reliable. You know that if you do radiotherapy, the PSA afterwards will go down, but you always will have some BPH left there. So you don't know exactly what is really the impact of PSA. But after surgery, if there is PSA, there is something there. These are the long-term data of radical prostatectomy, high-risk prostate cancer. And these are different papers. Stacey Lopes, Joe Waltz's paper, Borjan's data, uh, Dan Hong's paper, uh, Dusopovich's paper. And if you look here at overall survival, you will see that the cancer-specific survival, overall survival, is actually not that bad. It's around 80 and 90% at roughly uh, five years follow-up. So if you look at that, sorry, and if you look at, let me go back, and if you look at the outcomes, the most important thing in locally advanced prostate cancer, high-risk prostate cancer, is that you have to be specimen confined. I don't care if you're T3 or T4. If the margin is negative, this is a huge, huge difference to a patient who has margin positive. So in T2 disease, it's not so important to have positive margins or not, right, in T2. You should be upset, you should not even radiate the patient. But in T3 disease, a positive margin is detrimental. So it's important to be specimen confined. The specimen should be outside the tumor, so you should have removed everything. And then, if you're a specimen confined, in this study, you have 100% cancer-specific survival out of a follow-up of 120 months, which is roughly 10 years, in this study at least. And there are risk factors. There is very high-risk prostate cancer and very low-risk prostate cancer. And there is differences in survival. So, radical prostatectomy is not an option for every patient with T3 disease. If you have PSA of 50, please 9 in all your cores, and on MRI you have infiltration of the seminal vesicle on both sides, probably radical prostatectomy is not such a good case for it because the patient will not really benefit. But if you have PSA 20, a small T3A, or even on one unilateral seminal vesicle infiltration, no lymph nodes on PET PSMA, or just a few lymph nodes, that patient may benefit from surgery and lymphadenectomy better than doing radiotherapy and hormone therapy. So we are moving towards doing more and more surgery, like in bladder cancer. In bladder cancer, we remove lymph nodes, we remove the bladder, and it improves survival. In prostate, we never believed that. But today, we know that in high-risk prostate cancer, it helps. And then, of course, if you compare to radiotherapy, I'm not going to go into the detail, but surgery was superior to radiotherapy in high-risk prostate cancer at least in this 7,538 man from the CAPTURE database uh, published by Matt Cooperberg. And so uh, he said that, and he concluded, that the greatest benefit of the surgery was actually in high-risk prostate cancer. That's where the real benefit is for the patients. And if you compare surgery and radiotherapy in low-risk, intermediate, and high-risk prostate cancer, the real benefits of surgery are in intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer. This is, again, a very nice paper published also by Tewari many years ago. And you know this paper also by Peter Albertson. Same thing again. That the S is surgery, air radiotherapy. And you see that there is a bigger difference between surgery and radiotherapy in high-risk and intermediate risk disease. So actually, surgery is not good for localized disease because with localized disease, you can do everything. But actually, the real benefit of surgery is in high-risk disease. This is something we should remember. And remember also one thing. Uh, radiotherapy today with 72 gray or even 80 gray like in our hospital is extremely aggressive. 80 gray makes you impotent 100% and 80 gray will make you incontinent eventually also in a higher rate than before. So our radiotherapy colleagues which I appreciate a lot and I work a lot with them uh, acknowledge that their problem is they tell the patient data from 60 gray radiotherapy but today, they give them 70 to 80 gray radiotherapy. And if you look at the continents, long-term continents data, they are not very good with high dosage radiotherapy. Even if it's IMRT, and even if it's three-dimensional conformal radiotherapy, the results are not very good because the effect of high dose is, of course, incontinence and impotence. And the survival with surgery in high-risk prostate cancer is also very good. I'm not going to go into the detail. But more importantly, you can also look at rate of metastasis and one of the big benefits of radical prostatectomy and high-risk disease is you will have much less metastasis uh, in patients undergoing surgery versus 
radiotherapy plus hormone therapy. We roughly, in our series, had not one patient in the last seven, eight years when we started with high-risk disease that went into having metastasis. This is another paper by from Popol that looked at survival rates and clinical T3 disease, and look at 15 years, survival rate was 70 to 80% for high-risk disease. This is excellent results. And there's a lot of papers, I'm not gonna quote you, but there's a lot of papers looking at that, and they all conclude that there's increased survival in patients with high-risk disease. But of course, you need multi-modality treatment. If your patient is young and has seminal vesicle infiltration on both sides, I would recommend adjuvant radiotherapy or if he has potentially positive margins. The SWOG, the, I'm sorry, the URTC data from BOLA said you need positive margins. Okay, we do that for positive margins. In bilateral uh, seminal vesicle infiltration, there seems to be enough evidence that it may also be beneficial. Do we have long-term randomized data yet? No, not yet, we need them. But there is evidence to do that. Uh, so the current standing is that for clinical T2, anything works. For clinical T3, not all treatments will be equal. For low risk, high risk process, low risk, high risk, um, I think it's a better prognosis with surgery. And you should think of surgery in patients even with low volume metastatic disease in the lymph nodes. Um, and of course, the future is, I personally think, is PSMA PET. PSMA PET is an excellent way of identifying lymph node metastasis and recurrence after radical prostatectomy. We don't use choline PET anymore, or F18, or anything, or SPECT. We just use PSMA PET. It's the new kit on the block. Same thing as multiparametric MRI for biopsy is PSMA PET for staging and surgery. And I will strongly recommend you to go on this train of imaging for urology. Everything is changing with imaging, finally. We were waiting for this 20 years, and now it's there, and we should embrace it and not go against it, and we should talk to our radiology on, uh, colleagues. Just a few words on oligometastatic disease, because I think it's very important. What is the definition of oligometastatic disease? I'm just gonna go quickly. Oligometastatic disease means less than five metastatic sites uh, are considered, uh, and they are separate from polymetastatic sites. They seem to be less ag ag aggressive than metastatic phenotypes. And uh, even in a genetic basis, they look a little bit different. Um, what is oligometastatic is, for example, lymph nodes and maybe one small bone metastasis. Uh, this is considered oligometastasis. To make a long story short, there is a basis for that. It's immunological, because if you remove the primary tumor, like in kidney, the immunological censorship for the body is different, and those tumors may regress quicker. And uh, there's a biological basis also because, you know, there is, if you, if you leave the prostate inside, there's continuous shedding of cancer cells into the metastatic sites. But if you remove it, that shedding stops. And so, and it's an immune modulatory effect, blah, blah, blah. There is a lot of academic biological reasons why to do it. I'll give you a case quickly. A uh, 60-year-old man, he was a doctor. It's a real case. It's not an invented case for Dubai. It's a real case. PSA in 2016 was 210. His DRA was a clinic, clearly T3A. We did a biopsy, 10 out of 14, Gleason 7, and maximum choline hormone 80%. So it's, it's a heavy volume prostate cancer, and we did here uh, a multiparametric MRI and an MRI. And you can see also in the T2 that here you have very nice a big lesion in the prostate. His bone scan was negative. His chest CT and abdominal medical MRI showed one large lymph node, roughly three centimeter, bless you, in the left of third turkey fossa, and several, uh, several paraortic lymph nodes up to one centimeter below the renal vessels, no visceral, no bone metastasis, and the clinical staging was therefore clinical T3A, N1, M1A, Gleason 7, 4 plus 3. What to do with this patient? This is his picture. You can see the lymph nodes here and here. This is the big one. Uh, and here also. And uh, the patient was first started on hormone therapy. This was the old way to do it. You know, metastatic prostate cancer, started on hormone therapy. His PSA and he, he received Taxotir based on the newest data from Stampede. And we put them on and his PSA went down to 4.4. And this was a very positive sign that the patient is reacting well to hormone chemotherapy. And because of that, we decided to do radical prostatectomy in this oligometastatic disease. Remember, 
Before you do oligometastatic disease, you have to start the patient eventually on hormone therapy. If his PSA doesn't go down significantly, you shouldn't do the operation. So you do the hormone therapy first, PSA goes down, doesn't have to go to zero, but significantly down, more than 80%. This guy went from 200 to four, so he's a good responder. Then we did radical prostatectomy with super extended lymphadenectomy on him. Here you can see the lymph nodes all, to make a long story short, full of lymph nodes, but it's important to do a very good lymphadenectomy. And the pathology showed at least nine, uh, more, left, more or less in the left lobe, big tumor, uh, focal positive surgical margin, no seminal vesicle invasion, seven out of 64 lymph nodes were positive, on the left, uh, external iliac, obturatory fossa, common iliac. So we had a lot more lymph nodes than we thought we would have. Um, we continued hormone therapy in this patient. Um, he had a small lymphocyte, seal, but we didn't touch it. Continence is fully recovered. And now look at his PSA. And his PSA is outstanding. Um, I, because I couldn't put the new slide in because the, uh, it, it just the power would die down. But his PSA right now is 0.04. So it went from 0 0.01 to 0 0.04. But still, this is about two years ago now, and the patient is still doing very well. Um, if you really look at the data, and this is my last slides from Roosthoven, published uh, in 2016, and if you look at the combination of radiotherapy plus hormone therapy or surgery plus hormone therapy in oligometastatic disease, there seems to be that surgery is getting better and better. And there is a lot of papers coming out of cytoreductic pr uh, radical prostatectomy. One study uh, uh, has three sites. It's my department, Dr. Heidenreich in Köln, and another group in Germany near Munich in a private institution, which were doing actually a lot of cytoreductive prostatectomies in oligometastatic disease. And there seems to be, we believe, evidence that there is a role for radical prostatectomy in selected patients with metastatic prostate cancer, not with a lot of bone meds, but with one solitary bone med, lymph nodes, if patient is young, radical prostatectomy seems to be an option, and there is a role for that. Right now, there is prospective trials on this. One is in the MD Anderson Cancer Center, is going on. One is in, the, in Hamburg, and one is in a hospital in Ghent. This is the three study, four studies, three studies uh, away from our study, so there are four studies in total that are looking at that, roughly 100 to 80 patients. And we will uh, wait for the result of that. So that we look at the database uh, today, uh, we believe that local therapy is associated with survival benefit in patients with oligometastatic prostate cancer. And we also believe that at adding hormone therapy in these patients after local treatment, and it doesn't have to be surgery, it could also be radiotherapy. So you can also do radiotherapy for oligometastatic disease, may improve survival. And this is the most recent paper that came out this year I recommend you to read it. It's by Dr. Stoiber, looking at cytoreductive prostatectomy um, and its impact on prognosis. Read that paper, it's very interesting, and you will see that there is a slight benefit. I put the this uh, slide out of the paper that was just published. Uh, it's ahead of printing, it's an EPUB, and you can see that there's a slight benefit for surgery uh, in these patients. Having said so, I'm done again from Vienna for you. And the conclusions are, number one, there is emerging data that there is a benefit of surgery and radiotherapy, I mean local therapy, in metastatic disease. 10 years ago, if you had metastasis, nobody would do radiotherapy, nobody would do surgery. We would just do hormone therapy. Now we know we need hormone therapy potentially, but it's also good to do local therapy. Number two, um, it's still experimental. Don't go home today and do it immediately. Read it, make your mind, talk to the patient, it's very important. And we, of course, need to wait for these four trials to get a result. You can ask me, we have, in June 2018, we have from our series, we have about 50 patients. We have our first analysis in June 2018. You can email me, I can tell you what's going on. And you can also write to Hamburger and the Anderson and ask them about their outcomes and translate. Because I think in the UAE, there's a lot more high-risk disease or in Eastern Europe than we have in Western Europe or in the US. So these data are much more interesting for you than, for example, they would be interesting for French or American people. Thank you very much for your attention. I apologize I talked so long. Uh, I hope it was interesting, and I'd be happy to take your questions if you're not asleep yet. Thank you so much, Professor Ferris.
two talks actually, they're brilliant, and uh, I'm itching to ask how many questions, but unfortunately, due to the constraint of time, we will allow one, one question, please. Could I ask one question? Yeah? Of course, yeah. Yeah, thanks for a very stylish, beautiful talk, uh, Professor. Um, we've all had experience of men dying slowly and miserably of localized prostate cancer, and it's something you wouldn't wish on anyone. Have you been able to define a subset of patients, younger patients perhaps, who should have a radical prostatectomy, not for a life-saving situation, but for palliation? Um, well, I mean, what would be pal is palliation of local complications, yeah. retention, and locally advanced disease, because you said yeah, nerve disease. involvement, uh, local lymphedema, <laughs> scrotal edema. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's a slow and very hard death. Are there indications in your practice, or in anyone's practice here, to actually recommend in highly advanced or very aggressive local disease, with metastatic disease, to do a radical prostatectomy to save the patient from the six months of misery? Well, I think we had a case with Dr. Faribor, as we talked about it a while ago, I don't know when it was, two years ago, where he consulted. Um, so you have a patient with localized, it's never a localized disease, it's always a locally advanced disease, yeah, obviously. Exactly. So T3 or something, or T4 maybe. It involves the, the urethral orifices, the patient get hydronephrotic, he has obstruction, he goes into retention, he has pain. He normally also has metastasis. These patients do not go around without metastasis. We just don't know it probably at that point. But yes, there is an indication for palliative in these patients with, normally it's bilateral hydronephrosis and f If the patient responds well to hormone therapy, which means his PSA will come down quickly, I potentially will do what we call basically palliation surgery in which we do a conduit in this patient. So we remove the primary tumor if possible and do a conduit to at least preserve the kidneys. This is one thing you could do. And now there is a big trend in Europe for palliation, not only for prostate cancer, but also for bladder cancer, to do, believe it or not, more and more urethrocutaneostomies. So if the patient has bladder cancer very highly advanced and he's very sick and very old, you don't want to do cystectomy, he will not survive it. So you may as well do the following, you just put the ureters to the skin, for those who are not urologists, to have at least the kidneys diverted, and then you can do high volume, high dose radiotherapy to the small pelvis. But again, my message is exactly what you said. We are moving towards more and more surgery for aggressive disease, and less and less surgery for localized disease. So. The growth of our patients undergoing radical today are high-risk prostate cancers, not low-risk. Although I believe it would help also in low-risk, but I think that we should not be uh, too aggressive in times of active surveillance. Uh, we are given permission to ask uh, to give time for more questions. <laughs> so please go ahead. I have a urethral dysfunction. And he came to me and offered him the double jet. After the injection, he had pain. He went home, he was not able to have intercourse. And he came back to me and he said, with this, he cannot have intercourse. He went to another physician and he offered the same double jet. And the same thing happened. I don't know, I don't have any answer for him. So, as you all know, about 13% of patients on, on intracavernosal therapies have pain. So one way to do it is to change. Cavercheck is, I think, just with one product. There are two products. I don't know the names. I'm not an urology guy. But there's two products. I will either change the project. Obviously, the best way of getting bad erections at the radical prostatectomy is intracavernosal uh, injections if the medical therapy does not work. So I will switch to that. And if not, I will eventually go to Muse or using devices. There is the pump, the devices. So it doesn't have to be injections at all. How, was this patient a localized disease? Was this patient, uh, how long was he after radical prostatectomy? There was four months after radical prostatectomy and he was localized. And he started early on with, via, with PD-5 inhibitors? No, he started after three months. So you heard what I said before, I know you were here when, we, when I gave my talk, <coughs> is the surgery is one part of killing potency. The second part of, is us because we start too late with peanut rehabilitation. If you give the patients Viagra or Sildenafil or Tadalafil, whatever, early on it's good, but some people start after two months, after six weeks. It's too late. You know, as I said, this is not a camel. 
he cannot go around without blood for four weeks. He needs blood immediately. And if you don't do it immediately, in four months, it's basically sometimes too late. So the reason why he has pain, you know why he has pain, probably? No, I don't. Because the corpus cavernosum is so contracted and so atrophic. And you put now the intracavernosal injection, the blood wants to go in and basically tries to open the corpus cavernosum. You know how painful that can be, even imagining it. That's why it's painful. So unfortunately, you can try another type of injection. There's two types, as I said. But I think in these patients, the damage was already done. I don't think he will do very well with anything. Maybe if you can tell him to bear with the pain and continue, maybe if he continues a couple of times, it will become better. Otherwise, he has no option probably to go to penile prosthesis or anything like that. But I will give him some chance. Wait at least 12 months before you do that because it may improve a little bit. But you have to continue with him on injections. This corpus cavernosum needs to dilate again. He's not going to take any more injections. Shall I continue with the Viagra? Well, he needs to continue anyways. We put patients on Viagra, plus we give him every month or so an injection, okay. just to keep the corpus cavernosum from being flooded with blood. Thank you. But anyways, you have to sh they should have started early with it.